Aren't you glad God can do a work in someone's life? They don't have to wait to get to a certain age limit. You have to get a certain age to drive. You don't have to be a certain age for God to work grace into our lives. Good morning. How about those bills? <laughs> no one's more surprised than everyone. That's how that is. So, <clears throat> so uh, we're concluding a series this morning called The Key That Opens Every Door. And the key that opens every door is giving. But we haven't been talking about money. We've been talking about other things that we give. We talked about giving forgiveness. That when we forgive, it opens certain doors. We talked about giving worship. What happens? There's certain possibilities and potential that gets realized when we learn to worship the true and the living God. We talked about how we can give of ourselves, our talents, our abilities, the spiritual gifts that God has invested in us through worship. And today... I want to talk about how we give our faith to someone else. How do we share faith? And I, w I know this. This is one of the things that people really struggle with. How do I have a conversation with other people about my faith? And we're going to look at a passage today that is it's a phenomenal passage to help us unpack this. And I don't have time to read through the whole passage this morning. It starts in the first chapter of John 4. We're going to pick it up in chapter or verse 27. And it says that... Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then the disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws wage and harvest crops for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work. You have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. But because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Uh, really challenging to talk to other people about our faith. There's a lot of reasons for that. And uh, the first real reason is this, is that our faith is a very personal thing. It's a personal thing. Um, it is true that your family can provide information about faith, it's true they can even live out an example of faith. But they can't create faith in you or make you believe something. That in many ways, our faith journey is a very personal journey. And we have to take it for ourselves. So when we talk about personal things, that can be a little bit uncomfortable. And it's uncomfortable in our world to have conversations about faith, mostly because People in our culture don't really understand what faith does and what it doesn't do. They assume a lot of things. As soon as you start talking about faith conversations, they make a lot of assumptions. And so some people think that you're trying to impose a standard of living on them, that the reason you're talking to them is you want to change something about them. Some people think that when you talk about faith, it makes you feel superior to them. Other people actually believe that when you talk about faith, it's just an excuse to not do anything about real problems right now because someday God will fix it all or someday we'll be in heaven and it won't matter anymore. So we have a lot of reasons why people are uncomfortable with faith conversations. But while it is a personal thing, faith is not a private thing. 
It's a big difference between those two words. There, there is a public aspect to conversations we have about faith and how we live out our faith. You can't really do that in complete secrecy. It is possible to have these conversations, but is it possible to have them without, without fe having other people feel like you're putting them down or thinking less of them? Because let's be honest, a lot of times when Christians talk about their faith, we make it sound like we're better than they are. And that's why this passage is so incredibly important. Has anybody here ever been called for jury duty? Let's just see. Yeah. How many here were actually selected to serve on a jury? Uh, less people, yeah. Uh, I've been called and not selected. I've been called and selected. And I actually enjoy being in a courtroom. I, I love the process. I'm interested in the law. I, I like how the whole system works. One thing that I noticed when I was serving on a jury is that when someone comes to give a testimony, they can only give testimony about what they actually saw or what they actually heard. They can't give someone else's testimony. Well, I heard Mr. Brown say, no, no, you can't say that. What did you see? What did you hear for yourself? And when you think about it, that's when a person is most credible, right? Is when they're saying what they saw, what they experienced for themselves. Everything else is called hearsay, and that's not admissible in a court of law. Sharing our faith is most powerful when we give first-hand evidence of God's grace in our lives. Giving our testimony is very different than sharing the rules that we live by. Some people, as soon as they start sharing their faith, they start sharing their standards for living. That's not the same thing. It's not the same thing as sharing what happened to someone else. What has happened to you? It's not the same thing as, as, as just telling someone else's story. What has God's grace done in your life? What is your experience? What have you learned about yourself and about God? Those are very powerful conversations. But a lot of times we're uncomfortable having them. Now, the event we're looking at in Scripture today describes and reveals what happens when someone told other people about what God did in their life. Now, the story starts by where we picked up in Scripture. The disciples are returning. They've been picking up some food to bring it back. Uh, Jesus was uh, stayed at the well, and when they get there, he's talking to a woman, and they are very surprised because men didn't talk to women in public. That was considered out of bounds in those days. And because Jesus was Jewish and this woman was Samaritan, and as much as the Jews didn't want to interact with the Gentiles, you could magnify that many times over for how they felt about the Samaritans. And there's a whole historical context for why they disliked them as much as they do. And there were social barriers. That you, you didn't hang around people who were social outcasts. You didn't talk to them. You gave them no place in your life because if you were connected in any way to them, you would be defined by them. And Jesus is having a conversation. And he speaks to her really about two things. He speaks to her about real life and he speaks to her about her life. And this winds up being a significant conversation for her. This woman didn't know anything about Jesus and yet Jesus knew everything about her. So uh, he comes and, and uh, they, they start the conversation just about water, and then, and then Jesus tells her, he said, why don't you go get your husband? And she says, well, I'm not married. And Jesus said, you have spoken truly. Uh, you have been married five times. You're not currently married. The person you're living with, you're not married to. And she realizes in that moment, he knows everything there is to know about me. All the stuff she would prefer to hide. He already knows. And he's talking to me anyway. That's a really big deal. She was surprised that Jesus, a Jew, would speak to a Samaritan. She was surprised that Jesus, a man, would speak to a woman. She was surprised that Jesus, who was not an outcast, would speak to an outcast. She was surprised, she was surprised, but he addressed her deepest wound and darkest secret in a way that did not make her feel excluded. He talked to her anyway. 
So Jesus' disciples, they're surprised who he's talking to. But that is the moment she experienced grace for herself. For herself. So in that brief conversation, she experiences grace. Jesus didn't care about all the reasons this woman should be avoided. Jesus never does care about all the reasons that we think some people or ourselves should be avoided. So when this conversation was over, the woman actually runs back into the town and she starts telling everybody that will listen to her, you need to come see this man. He knows everything. He told me everything about me. This is a really big deal. He told me everything about me. We know that by the time of day that she's going to get water, she's trying to avoid people in her town. The time of day in the ancient world you would go get water is not when the day was at its hottest because the water jugs were large and they were heavy when they were filled with water and that was the worst time of day to carry water. All the people who carried water came early in the morning while it was still a little bit cool, and then you could have water where you needed it for the rest of the day. She's avoiding people. She doesn't want to have conversations with them. And now she's having conversations with people that she was trying to avoid just a minute ago. What changed? One conversation with Jesus. She experienced grace, and in that moment, shame was destroyed in her life. I'll talk more in a minute just about how a big a deal that is. So Jesus started from where they were. So she goes and she, she tells her, her story to everybody, and people start coming. Could this be the Messiah? And the interesting thing about the Samaritan's concept of Messiah was very different from the Jewish concept of Messiah. The Jewish concept is that there would be almost a king, a military leader who would come and rescue them, and in the Samaritan concept, there would be a very wise teacher who would come and explain life. Now it would make sense. Now you would know how to work the system because someone would explain it to you. And what's fascinating is that Jesus starts with what they do believe and leads them beyond the limits of their belief. I don't know why Christians do this. We often come to people who have a different belief system or they claim they have a no belief system and the first thing we feel obligated to do is to destroy the foundation that they think they are standing on. And we think that you can't really accept Jesus unless we obliterate everything. You have to denounce anything else as having any truth in it at all. Why do we do that? Where did we learn that? Show me an example where Jesus did that. Jesus starts where they are, and he begins to teach them. He begins to talk with them. And so he begins with, with things that they do accept and then leads them beyond. He, he shows them your belief system is limiting what God can do in your life. Let me show you how this works. He identifies things that they actually want, which most people want good things. They're just willing to do unhealthy things to get them. So Jesus shows how the way your belief system is structured and the way that you choose to live actually works against getting the very thing your heart craves. What if you were to consider this? So Jesus starts where people are, and he leads them to where he is. So... How do we do this? How do we have these kinds of conversations? And there's three great lessons here. And the first is this, is that if you want to, others to experience grace from a conversation that you have with them, you have to start with humility. You have to be humble. That's not putting yourself down. It's just being honest. Honest about yourself. Honest about your experience. All right? The woman tells everybody that will listen, Jesus knew everything about me. Now, remember, she already has a reputation in which she has great shame. And by the way, it has always been true in every culture and every generation that when a woman is experiencing shame, there's just a bunch of assumptions that get made about her. So if you listen to any kind of uh, preaching on this woman, you usually hear that she was a very promiscuous individual, and that's why she'd gone through five husbands, and, and that's why she was living with someone who is not her husband now. I can come up with other scenarios why that happened to her, and she would be ashamed. And yet, it's amazing, the conclusions. A, a culture, a culture that claims to be so tolerant is not. 
Never has been. People jump to the worst conclusion about you consistently. And so she's going through this experience. She's got shame. So she comes to Jesus. He's able to talk to her about all these experiences in her life. And, and the result is, is that the shame is released. If it, shame is one of the most toxic substances ever known to man. If, if we could isolate it and bottle it and get rid of it, our planet would be a lot better. Uh, but it just permeates almost everyone and everywhere. And so he doesn't want people to operate out of shame. She was able to talk about her experience in the context of grace. So this isn't complicated. You don't have to tell someone else's story. You don't have to hide things that are true about you. This is a natural part of relationship, isn't it? The closer you get to other people, the more you open your life. Is that how it works? That's how it's supposed to work. Oh, let me see. Have you ever been in one of these scenarios where someone is giving you far too much information about their life for how well you know them? Have, yep. Have you ever been in a, in a party or a gathering and some family member or friend of yours, for whatever reason, is just opening up and sharing? We have three letters to describe that, don't we? What are the three letters? TMI. It stands for too much information. We don't want to know that. You know, just, you're telling me too much. Tim, I don't want to know. Because there's been no relationship established. But isn't it true that as relationships are established, you allow more and more of yourself to be known? Well, this is not intended to be a counseling moment, but I can tell you this. Most of us hide lots of our lives, and we want our relationships to go deep, and they can't because we're hiding. We're hiding in shame. People have been hiding things in shame since the Garden of Eden. And it didn't work for them, and it won't work for us. The reason we hide things is we're trying to control the outcome of the relationship. You can't. And hiding aspects of your life keep it from going to the depths that you crave. It just doesn't work. So this woman is no longer interested in hiding parts of her life. She already had a reputation that used to cause her to avoid everyone. And now she's actually using that reputation to explain the difference that God has made in her life. So if, if you are a person of faith, if you've experienced grace and you are not naturally sharing that, just an outflow of conversation with people that you are developing a relationship with, then maybe it's one of a couple things. Maybe the first thing is that grace hasn't worked a significant enough thing in you yet. And so you don't really have that much of a story to tell. Maybe you're just kind of on the entry levels of your spiritual journey. And you don't have to go deep to let God do a deep work in you. But you do have to let God do a deep work in you. Or maybe you're just feeling guilty and fearful and you want others to not know that part of your life. Humility just acknowledges this is what has been true about me and this is how God has rescued me from that or how God has changed me in that. The second thing is that we need to learn how to be, or to, to keep it simple. Keep it simple. Sometimes we try to share Sometimes we try to complicate the gospel. Have you ever noticed? You know, you're going to share with someone, and I've seen people do this. They try to start the conversation about whether you believe in pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-tribulation. And a person who doesn't know anything about that is just looking at you and go, what are you talking about? Are, do you believe in ordinances or sacraments? What, what are you talking about? Well, well, do you believe in, in predestination and election, or are, are, are you a Calvinist, or are you Arminianist? They don't know, you know, neither one of those. Calvin, wasn't that a guy It was a cartoon book? I remember reading it as a kid. <laughs> That's all I know. What's that? And, and people, they struggle. Why do we do this to people? Why do we bring The woman talked about Jesus. Come see a man. Come see this man. Talk about Jesus. We talk about doctrinal definitions. We will talk about standards of conduct. Oh, Christians shouldn't do that. If you're a Christian, oh, I've seen people do this. Oh, the, someone will offer them something. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm a Christian. <laughs> okay. 
yeah, that's great. How many people came up to you and said, I noticed you refused that particular thing. What must I do to be saved? <laughs> said no one ever. We talk about causes. We talk about preferences, which we always assume that our preference and God's preference are the same thing. We talk about priorities. This woman just talked about Jesus. That's it. Come see a man. Christianity is not a set of rules. Christianity is Jesus. That's it. Jesus did not say, here is the way of life. Stay on it and be careful to stay on it and you will get there. He never said that. That's what every other religious leader in the world who's ever lived has said. That's the way of life. Walk in it. Jesus did not say that. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He calls us to him. He is Christianity. If we introduce people to Jesus, they experience grace. That's how it works. That's how it works. So we have to keep it simple. I didn't put on the last word there. Then show some courage. Show some courage. No, I will not do an imitation of the lion in The Wizard of Oz. But show some courage. This woman came at the hottest and the hardest time of the day. And, and now she's going back to talk to people that she was trying to avoid just minutes ago. She, if, if, people, if people knew what you believed, if we have people in our lives who don't know we're Christians. And we're concerned that once they discover that, they're going to think less of us. Or maybe they will even mistreat us. And so she wanted to avoid because of her shame, but now she goes to people and she says, you got to see this guy. Grace helped her overcome her fear of rejection. That conversation with Jesus killed shame in her. Can you imagine what your life could be like if you weren't thinking and processing and reacting to shame. It's an unbelievable difference. Someone who knew everything about her loved her anyway. And when you have that kind of acceptance, that opens you up in life. Someone might reject you, and you might feel the pain of it, but it's not the ultimate thing because the most important person has already accepted you. That we care so much about what others think of us might be an indication that we need to allow the grace of God to go deeper in us. Now, our culture also assumes that it's wrong for you to try to convince people of faith-based things. You shouldn't try to convert people to your point of view. And, and our culture is developing a stronger and stronger opinion about this. And, uh, well, you should just let people figure it out for themselves. Let them come to their own conclusions. Let them do their own research. Let, let them, you know, just leave them alone. It'll be fine. Uh, can I tell you, we don't do that in any other area in life. Not one. Uh, for example, if you had a physical issue that required medication or treatment, and, and its success had only been mediocre, but that's all that was available, and then they came across a prescription or a treatment that actually significantly improved to the point that you're symptom-free, would you share that with anybody? Well, you know, I don't want to convince them. You know, they, they, they've got their own medications, they've got their own treatments. No, you would tell somebody. It doesn't even have to be that important. If, if you attend a concert you really like, do you just keep that to yourself? You don't. I've seen your Facebook posts. You are living it up and having a great time, and what a great concert. Even if you just hear an album you really like, you got to share that. You post about that. If, if you see a work of art you think is phenomenal, you talk about that. If you read a book that you really like, you share that. Oh, you should say, this was a great book. Usually I don't like to read, but I read that. What a difference that made. Wow, that was really good. Um, I, I realized I hadn't read a work of fiction for over 10 years in my life. 
I do a lot of reading, but I just don't have time for fiction. And so my daughter recommended a book to me. And so I said, well, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of time. She said, Dad, I'm, I'm a prolific reader. I read all the time. This book was so good that when I was done, I couldn't read anything else for a month. I'm going, wow. But I didn't do it. And then my... <laughs> And then my wife found out about it, and so she got the book, and she read it. And my wife is a prolific reader. I mean, she reads all the time. And when she finished that book, she didn't read anything else for a month. I go, wow, what is this book that stops people from reading for 30 days? And I finally read the book, and it was one of the most enjoyable books I have ever read, fictional works I've ever read in my life. I know, you're all asking, what's the book, what's the book, what's the book? And I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> See how that feels? <laughs> That's what happens when we don't tell people about Jesus. We're just a one big giant letdown. We'll see a show. We see a series. We binge watch something. What do we do? We tell other people. We're always telling other people about the things that we've enjoyed or that are making a difference in our life. The other thing that people struggle with you know, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't try to impose your faith on someone else. Okay, we do share what works in our lives. Secondly, well, you know, it's not good to, to be one of those kind of people who have exclusive truth claims, like Jesus is the only way, and then they always find some group that, they, well, what about those people? And we really struggle with this. First of all, I want you to know this. Everyone makes exclusive truth claims. You have not met the exception to that rule. Now you might be thinking, oh, oh yes, I have met that person. Or you might even be saying, I am that person. I believe that all, all religions have, have truth in them. And that if we're tolerant, we can learn from them. And, and that's, I, I, I believe that all religions have truth. Oh, really? So what do you feel about people who don't believe what you believe? You think they're narrow-minded? Do you think they're bigoted? Do you think they're wrong? Do you think they're offensive? You know what you've done? You've created an exclusive truth claim. All religions have uh, exclusive truth claims, but everyone does. I heard one pastor put it this way. He said, there are two kinds of people in the world, people who have exclusive truth claims and people who make exclusive truth claims and don't realize that's what they're doing. Everybody does this. So that's not different. It, if, if we say Jesus is the way, we're not doing anything different than every other faith and everybody individual has ever done. Just two more points to, to close this today. And the first is this. Grace begins with truth. It always does. God already knows you completely and he loves you unendingly. And that is not going to change. For you to experience grace, you have to allow God to see all of you. Yes, your deepest wounds, your deepest secrets, all of you. You don't have to pretend anything with God ever. In fact, pretend is the one thing grace can't change. You start with the truth, and you realize that living water always flows to the lowest point. It flows to your greatest wound, and it flows to your darkest secret. We spend so much time and energy in our lives trying to have our deepest wound healed. And a lot of times, we will use substitutes for God because we want our wounds to be healed in secret. But God says that if you will bring things out into the light, he can transform anything. Now, there's a little detail. I don't know if you noticed it, but it's a really big deal. The little detail is she left her water jar at the well and went running back into the town, which is exactly what you do when you are not thirsty anymore. So what have you left behind because your heart was full and your spirit was renewed? Or what might you need to leave behind today before you leave here? 
There's one tension point that just occurred to me while I was reading this passage, and that is uh, Jesus is talking to her about living water, and if you drink it, you will never be thirsty again. And yet one of the last words of Jesus in this world was, I thirst. So why, when he's hanging on a cross, is he thirsty? And it's because in that moment, he's allowing the justice of God to take its full toll on him. All the penalty, all the pain, all the distance that comes from disobedience was placed on him in that moment. And he allowed himself to be thirsty so that none of us would ever have to be. Jesus knows all the things about you. And he loves you anyway. Once you know that, once you trust that, once you've experienced that, you will have a story to tell. You will be able to share your faith. And others will be able to experience grace because of it. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, I re really feel like I want to focus on something right now. There, there might be a part of you that just goes, yeah, well, if, if people knew this about me. Or maybe it's something you haven't even ever brought up to God. Because you think it's such an offensive thing to God that he wouldn't be able to get past it. He already knows. The, the, the grace story always starts with God knows the entire truth about me. All my weaknesses, all my struggles, all my insecurities, all of it. He knows all of it. There's not one detail he's missing. He knows all of it. And he loves me anyway. And that truth is where grace begins. And if you will allow grace to flow to the deepest point in your life, you'll be able to leave your water jar today. So, Father, we don't hide anything. You already know. We bring it all out into the light for you because we trust you, your love, and your grace transform these things, not just so that we can move past them, but that you can actually use them as part of our testimony, our personal experience about what you have done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.